Go after terrorists and bandits now, says President Buhari to service chiefs. And ex-presidential candidate Kingsley Mogalu accuses the army of arson in Imo State. Well, this is Cross Politics. President Muhammad Buhari, after a national uh, security meeting with service chiefs and heads of other security agencies, placed a charge on them to go after the terrorists and bandits terrorizing Nigerians, especially on the highways. According to him, security operators will not rest until Nigerians are at peace. Well, joining us to discuss this is a security expert, Dennis Amakri. Thank you very much, Mr. Amakri, for joining us. Good evening. Great. Um, this is not the first time that we're hearing the president make statements like this, go after the terrorists, make, uh, terrorists will, um, they will soon meet their Waterloo. We've heard these types of statements and we continuously see these bandits release all kinds of mayhem on Nigerians in different places. I mean, um, we've seen kidnappings upon kidnappings and killings sometimes. Um, but it, all these strong words from Mr. President, un unfortunately, seems not to be, you know, um, metamorphosing into action. Well, you know that um, a very, very important event happened uh, in the last 24 hours, where a, a court in Abuja had declared those bandits as terrorists. And that declaration carries with it a lot a lot of things. So um, I think the president was in order by asking the uh, service chiefs to go out now and uh, deal with those terrorists. Because remember, when they were the, when the Tokano jets were delivered to them, they could not use them because uh, the contract uh, conditions don't allow uh, using those things on bandits who are seen as just ordinary tips, you know. Uh -huh. They are supposed to use it on terrorists. But now that the court has declared those guys to be terrorists, then I think uh, we, are, we are heading somewhere. Um, I, I want to quickly point out some of the issues that um, would constitute, you know, this push by Mr. President and this statement. Uh, we also know that the Kaduna um, uh, Abuja Highway has somewhat become a point where these people continuously kidnap, whether they're bandits or not. But there's, there's a lot of kidnapping, killings. You saw the videos from last week uh, of, you know, the cars that people were taken from. I, I don't, thinking about it is already scarring for me. But, but they continuously go to those places to snatch people from vehicles um, every single time and get away with it. So I'm wondering, because you and I know that if you travel from one place to the other in Nigeria, especially on the highways, the federal highways, you would see um, points, whether they be police checkpoints or army checkpoints. How do these people continuously get away with murder on, on that particular stretch? Uh, because that stretch actually um, encompasses those areas that uh, we have been referring to as ungoverned spaces. And those spaces are areas where you know, you don't have the presence of police or, you know, or soldiers um, uh, around. So they are out there uh, behaving as if uh, they own the place. Um, even, um, you remember all these, uh, some religious people that go into the bush to go and see them and talk with them. Uh, they, they are all hidden out there. But um, I know that uh, because of maybe some encumbrances, they could not really go there and flush them out. But with what is happening right now, I believe that they should be able to focus and then, of course, clear them out. Because the Kaduna Abuja Road you just uh, mentioned is becoming a real embarrassment, you know, where people cannot. And in four consecutive days, they were there operating, you know. So... I think the military have to stop this cat and mouse. In fact, the police and the military have to stop the cat and mouse and deal with them because people should be safe to move from one place to the other. Mm. Let's talk about the army. Yesterday I had a retired Air Vice Marshal on the show talking about um, the welfare of soldiers, 
um, you know, they going to the National Assembly to ask for support, more support, to be able to deal with this issue of insecurity. And it, it really makes me wonder. Um, I was having a conversation with another person who said that we don't have enough soldiers in the country to deal with the insecurity uh, that we need to, um, as we would want to. And that's why, you know, these people seem to have a, an upper hand. But is that really, truly the case? Well, um, the number, the military, police, and SEDC, DSS, and IA, all put together are not up to 2 million. You know, really? they are not up to 2 million. In a country of more than 200 million people. You know, even the police will be taken. The, the police is finding it so difficult to police this country because they are so thinly spread. There are about 400,000. And as 400,000, remember we have 774 local governments in this country. Mm. Let's say they send a DPO to each of them. You know, the balance, think of the mobiles that are following the uh, politicians around. And, you know, so you find out that it is inadequate, actually. But I don't know why they are not recruiting, because that is what we have. And that is what the terrorists are doing that we are not doing. Mm. They constantly recruit, you know, and they lure people to join them with either money, food, all kinds of things, you know. So I think we should um, lift that ban on employment and uh, unemployment and employ, uh, put more people in the army, put more people in the, in the, in the, um, uh, in the police, and then of course even the DSS and the NIA. That way we have a lot of operatives on the field, and then of course they can synergize and uh, bring good results. If you, I, I mean, I know you have you you have been a director uh, in the uh, uh, DSS, but. Um, looking at the welfare of, again, um, members of the armed forces, um, looking at the welfare of police officers, I mean, have you seen a police barracks recently? Um, looking at the welfare of these people generally, why would anybody want to be recruited into any of these uniformed agencies? I mean, yes, people w would want to put an end to the insecurity that we're facing, but what is... What, what's in the back end for them? Who's protecting them? Who's protecting their families? What's, what's the fallback plan? Uh, yes. That, uh, when we say recruit, means that you have to do all necessary things. You have to do all necessary things. Because if you don't recruit, when you are recruiting, you are also thinking of salaries. You know? You are also thinking of housing. You cannot recruit officers and then tell them to go and look for accommodation. So the recruitment process includes all the necessary things that come with recruiting somebody. Uniforms, salaries, housing, cars that the officers and other men will be using. All these things have to come with that recruitment. So um, I believe strongly that um, there may be that's what is holding them back. but we are in a situation of war. And I think the National Assembly should stand up and release money for this event to take place so that we can clear this out. It is dragging this country too bad. And then, of course, if you put it on a scale, the disadvantages are more than the advantages, you know, if we don't recruit. Let's talk about the Ethiopian example. I'm sure you're, um, you have a bird's eye view of what's happening in Ethiopia with the TPLF and, uh, um, you know, somewhat of a reprisal that's happening. Now, they, they, they're wanting to match on the capital. And you see that Ethiopia is recruiting every single person that they can find to join the army. Um, maybe not necessarily through the normal means, but they're saying we need to fight off this enemy and this insecurity. Is that a route that we might want to go to, you know, stem the tide of what's coming at us? And during war, things do happen. More recruitment or even conscription. Conscription. Because if it is become so difficult, there will be conscription. Um, during the Civil War in Nigeria, many, you know, many people were conscripted into the army. On both sides. 
Biafran army, we, we are conscripting people. The Nigerian army was conscripting. Right now, what we have is a voluntary army. If you like, you join. If you don't like, you don't. But if they now bring up a law that we are facing a situation and we need people to go in there and fight, then the Nigerian army is going to conscript, you know, they will say everybody above 18 should come and register. And then, of course, those people will register, and then they will take who they will take, and then send them to the war front, train them, and send them to the war front. So, yes, what is happening in Ethiopia is the right move, because if they depend on the standing army, those guys might run over their capital. Mm. Let's talk about the sympathizers and those who uh, seem to be wish, well wishes of these terrorists. Now, recently, the Zamfara state government had shut down a bakery and a feeling station that they think has been servicing um, these bandits in that state. And you know what's going on in Zamfara and how, they have, how much they have to deal with. But um, the, I'm asking this question in terms of intel and how we can deal with that, because it's one thing to try to fight off the bandits. But it's another if there are people who are still like moles or uh, informants for these people or sympathizing with them. In the case of the bandits, I'm wondering who, what the sympathizers are for. But like you see, they've shut down a bakery. Obviously, these are the people who feed them. And then the feeding station who feels their, um, um, the bikes uh, or the motorbikes that they use to go around uh, to commit this mayhem. Are we getting enough intel? Are people... Uh, do you think people are really doing the, the, the best that they can do to keep themselves safe from these terrorists and, and making sure that they fish out those who seem to be their sympathizers? Yes, I think uh, we have to change our approach um, in dealing with this particular situation. Uh, you know, one of the approaches that could be used is what we call the all-society approach. The all-society approach, because when you look at what has been happening over the years, it is like we are looking at the army or the SSS or the police to go ahead and fight and then find the result, you know, of what is happening. We are sitting on the fence. The whole civilian population is sitting on the fence. And it's not supposed to be like that. That's why I said if either they conscript or the people will become actively involved, whereby you are either bringing in intel, you know, there are many details that can be brought. Who are the people that are selling them petrol to fill those bikes? How did they get the bike motorcycles? Who bought them for them? You know, these are intels that we will need. Because one thing you will know about situations like this is if you don't cut off the supply, logic, the supply chain, you know, then it will continue because those sympathizers are making money, sending people in there, and, you know, helping the terrorists. So we want to know those people who are buying them, uh, uh, the hillocks they are using. We want to find out uh, those who are selling or giving them the AK-47. One AK-47 is about 400,000 Naira. One, a single one, is about 400,000 Naira. Those ragtag guys you see there, we can use the all society approach whereby everybody gets involved right now we as a society are allowing only the military to be fighting it and then in fact ungratefully sometimes even um, uh, accusing them or uh, saying oh the the bandits have better guns than them and then of course uh, they, they are getting all kinds of publicity you know so we can all get involved whereby the society will go ahead and feed information to the security agents, you know, who is buying the motorcycles for them, who is buying the hillocks for them, you know, who is selling them petrol, who is sending them food. These are all intel, intel nuggets that we can actually, you know, invest. Mm. So let's talk about surveillance. Um, I mean, we, we have the normal surveillance that is obvious. And I mean, I'm not an expert, but you know what I'm saying. How do we intensify this surveillance and then minimize all threats whatsoever? Do, you ne do we necessarily have to have security operatives on these surveillances? Because again, you asked a very important question. Who's giving them these bikes? Who's 
who's giving them the monies? How are they able to, um, you know, get all of these guns? If, if yeah. shouldn't there be some sort of surveillance? Especially, we still have some of these people who have surrendered in our custody. How are we using those people um, to be able to have the upper hand in winning this war, which is not a, a very conventional one? Well, you have already answered the question, see, because um, that is part of the surveillance we're talking about, or the involvement of the public, you know, or involvement of those uh, de-radicalized ones. It is not de-radicalizing them and sending them back to their homes. De-radicalize them and use them, you know, and of course, debrief them. They will tell you a lot of stories of what is going on, you know, and then if you really want some serious information, you can send some of them back into the camp. You know, they can go in and say, oh, I ran out. I, you know, I was captured, but I escaped and I'm back now. And those people can give them all kinds of uh, information or they can observe. And then, of course, feedback. So um, there are a lot of things to do when it comes to surveillance. Technology, we've not deployed technology appropriately, you know, so that all these ones can be out there. You're talking of the Kaduna Abuja Expressway. Now, why don't we put in about two or three drones on that road? That two or three drones will always report back immediately, real time, whereby it will tell that, look, some groups are moving towards the expressway. Now, there might be bandits, you know, and they are going. And then, of course, a response team will dash down there. We know that uh, what happened about three, four days ago, where after the bandits have run away, then we have uh, the security forces coming in. Mm. Uh, but if we have a quick force... Mr. Macri, are you still there? Oh dear, we're having this uh, disconnection issues, but I think that that's where we're going to wrap it up for now. Um, Dennis Macri is a former deputy director of the DSS, and he's been talking to us about insecurity in the country. Well, thank you for staying with us. We'll take a quick break, and when we return, Kingsley Mogalu, a former presidential candidate, accuses the Nigerian army of Asin in Imo State. But we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about that.